Hello, and welcome to episode two of the Catholuminescence Explained webinar series. Today's topic is understanding micro LED arrays. In this webinar, we will learn how CL can be used to determine material and optical properties of inorganic semiconductors. Although this webinar is focused on a specific device structure, it will also serve to illustrate some of the general analysis concepts used in the characterization of optoelectrical materials and devices using CL. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Jonathan Lee, application scientist for cathodoluminescence at Catan. His background includes the use of CL spectroscopy and time-resolved CL to characterize defect levels in gallium oxide to gain his doctorate from the University of Central Florida. He recently joined Gatan as an application scientist developing and demonstrating the capabilities of the newly released Monarch CL detector, the system that has been used to capture most of the data in this presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage you to ask questions for the speaker. Submit all inquiries through the questions pane. Questions for the speaker will be answered after the presentation. If there is insufficient time to answer all questions, answers will be provided by email response from a member of the applications team at Catan. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to offline. More details at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand you over to Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Parker, and welcome everyone to episode two of Cathodal Luminescence Explained, uh, where today's episode deals with understanding micro LED arrays. <clears throat> so some of the questions that we're planning to answer in, in today's presentation is uh, what are some of the applications for micro LED arrays and how can cathodal luminescence be used to characterize these types of devices? Um, we're gonna focus on LED characteristics including compositional mapping, defects, uh, emission angles, and general device properties from LEDs and their respective arrays, uh, including the effects of the array itself on the light's emission. So just to remind all of the viewers, what is luminescence? Uh, luminescence is the emission of photons from a solid when excited by some energy source. Uh, that energy source can be uh, various various types of things including chemical reactions, it can be a light source like a laser, uh, it can be electrical like applying a voltage uh, as in LEDs. But cathodoluminescence or CL as we sometimes refer to it is whenever uh, luminescence is excited and the energy source is electrons. So whenever we <clears throat> focus an electron beam onto a material uh, we excite light uh, and a typical example of this is what's known as a CRT or a cathode ray tube television set. So if you've ever seen one of the large bulky television sets, that used to be fairly common, um, the light that comes out of those comes from a finely focused electron beam that uh, strikes a phosphor at the front of, of the screen and then it emits light. And that's where the image comes from. Luminescence um, covers a, a large portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and we can, in general, we look at the light that comes from the ultraviolet, the visible, and out into the mid-wave infrared. So here we can see a depiction of the electromagnetic spectrum, and you can see which portion of that of the spectrum uh, that CL is typically dealing with and where the visible wavelengths are. Uh, as our topic today includes LEDs and LED applications, um, Looking at LED materials, we could say LEDs are generally made up of semiconductors which luminesce based on their band gaps. So this is an energy diagram for a typical semiconductor where you can see the valence band is at a lower energy than a conduction band. Now these bands are where electrons are allowed to occupy. So <clears throat> in the valence band, electrons are generally bound. Uh, they can't move very freely from atom to atom and um, they're restricted in that way. If we insert some energy, like say from an electron beam, we can uh, excite electrons from the valence band up into the conduction band. Um, so once an electron is excited from the valence band into the conduction band, it leaves behind a vacancy or what we call a hole, which is equivalently a positive charge and it's surrounded by 
the electrons in the valence band. Um, after some scattering around, the electron in the conduction band eventually will fall back down into a hole in the valence band and recombine. Uh, once that recombination occurs across the band gap or the forbidden band, uh, a photon is emitted with the energy characteristic to the band gap in that semiconductor material. So that's important because if we can tune the band gap in a semiconductor material, then we can tune the LED's emission of light uh, to certain colors. And in fact, the blue LED was invented in the mid-90s in order to address um, just that. So before that, uh, we had red LEDs and green LEDs, but then the blue LED was invented. Um, and it was done so by looking at the band gap as a function of indium concentration in gallium nitride. So once it becomes a compound semiconductor of indium gallium nitride, by varying the concentration of indium versus gallium, you can tune the band gap across the visible wavelengths and in fact into the infrared or the ultraviolet. So here you have uh, on the right the, the respective band gap energy as a function of uh, lattice constant, which is characteristic again to the concentration of indium versus gallium and the corresponding wavelengths over on the right. So LED arrays are kind of a, a hot topic uh, for researchers right now because they enable us to go to higher resolution display technology. So <clears throat> whenever you're trying to improve the resolution of something like a television or entertainment device or say a mobile phone, um, you need to shrink the LED size down. So an LED is made up of red, green, and blue emitters. Uh, typical LED is depicted here in the center of the screen where we can see um, several reds, greens, and blues inside a single LED pixel. Now, to improve resolution, uh, what we can do is we can shrink down the size of the emitters into what's known as a micro LED, and it's about one hundredth of the size of uh, your traditional LEDs. The effect that this has on, on the volume is depicted here, where we can see kind of a, a cartoon schematic of an LCD uh, emitter or an LCD screen cross-section, an OLED cross-section, or an organic LED, and then what a micro LED's cross-section looks like. And what we can see is that we've reduced the device thickness dramatically by going to micro LEDs. So this reduces the footprint, gives you lighter weight devices, and um, again, improves resolution above the other two. However, um, reducing the emitter size leads to some issues, including that um, with the same power applied to those emitters, we get less irradiance. So less light is emitted in general from a smaller LED, so the volume is reduced. Um, since there's less irradiance, uh, to get back to the same irradiance, they require a higher applied power. So that higher power consumption leads to higher heat dissipation requirements. So in order to in order to combat those problems, researchers are moving to different shapes and and types of LEDs and, and arrays um, in order to overcome those issues. So cathodoluminescence microscopy is a, is a microscopy technique that generally takes place, as I said, um, it, it's coming from an energetic electron beam that strikes a sample. So it's uh, generally taking place inside a scanning electron microscope or a transmission electron microscope. So here you have a schematic of a scanning electron microscope. Uh, and then as the sample gets shot with the beam, then <clears throat> we have what's called the generation volume inside the sample where lots of processes are stimulated. So the electron beam enters the sample, electrons scatter around, and, and the sample then emits several things that give us uh, information, including secondary electrons, which tell us about uh, topology. The transmitted electrons can tell us about crystallography. Uh, we get x-rays out that tell us about composition analysis. and Another, and what we concern our with, ourselves with here in cathodoluminescence is the, the light that comes out, which tells us about the optical and the electronic properties of interest in that sample. So looking just at the CL tells us about um, the optical and the chemical structural properties from the macro down to the nanoscale. The scale or the resolution in space is um, determined by the electron beam's focus. So the smaller you can make the electron beam, uh, then in general, the the finer resolution you can get in the light's emission. Um, the high energy electron beam 
uh, or scanning or transmission electron microscope um, allows us to to excite across any of the visible wavelengths because the electron beam's energy is generally much higher than than the energy of any visible light. Um, the position of the electron beam in either case can be readily controlled and focused down to a very, very fine spot and positioned with great accuracy and repeatability. Uh, so that gives us a lot of ability in, in, in determining information with cathode luminescence. Uh, the way that the cathode luminescence is collected or acquired by our tool is that um, a tool like a, this is a depiction of our monarch detector is attached to the side of the SEM chamber and then <clears throat> a parabolic collection mirror is inserted into the column. It actually goes into the beam's path. So this is a, a cross-section depiction of the parabolic collection mirror that's been inserted into the electron beam path. And you can see the electron beam is actually going through an aperture in the collection mirror and still striking the sample. The light that comes out of the sample is then collected by that mirror and reflected back into the tool for analysis. This allows us to acquire point spectra by pointing the electron beam at a very specific point and analyzing that data spectroscopically and gathering a spectrum from a point of interest, or we can collect what's known as a spectrum image or sometimes a hyperspectral map, where as we scan the electron beam, we can determine what is the spectrum from any given point um, over an XY surface. So what's critical to collecting that sort of data is positioning the, elect, uh, positioning the sample beneath uh, the optics such that the sample is at the optical focus. Um, this used to depend on the user uh, pretty much exclusively such that a user uh, had to be able to position the sample right at the optical focus of the mirror. Um, but complexity in that alignment prevents novice users from achieving expert results. So here you have kind of a, as an example, um, the comparison of an easy specimen versus a difficult specimen and a novice user using a mono seal 4 What you can see in the easy specimen is that uh, the novice user is able to gather some spectrum, um, but it's not particularly intense. And then the difficult specimen, um, the novice user is not able to get above the noise floor. Uh, the expert user is able to come and um, focus the, the sample in a more superior way such that more light is coupled into the spectrometer and we can see uh, a great improvement over, over um, the light intensity based on the user's ability. Um, so kind of a breakthrough that we've had in CL technology uh, with the Monarch detector is that We've, able, we've been able to uh, design an independent routine that aligns the sample uh, without any input from the user or light from the sample. So this allows the monarch to, without any effort from the user, uh, focus the, the optics in such a way that it's superior to in either the novice or the expert user. So once the microscope is focused, we can begin collecting data from our samples of interest. And in particular, um, researchers are looking towards um, pillar type designs in order to improve the emission properties of micro LED arrays. So in this case, we look at a hexagonal core shell pillar, um, which has indium gallium nitride on the outside and gallium nitride core. Uh, the reason we go to this pillar structure is that we have an increased emission surface area as opposed to a 2D structure which would just have uh, the area on an XY surface. So here we go in the Z direction as well. Um, this also has the benefit of having a greater quantum well coverage. So the entire surface of this pillar is made up of a quantum well. Uh, it also allows us to access the low defect M plane surface which is on the horizontal or uh, along the vertical on the pillar. What you can see here is the band description or the band diagram along the M plane versus the C plane. So the C plane is the top of the pillar and the M plane is perpendicular to that. What we see is that 
there's a polarization that takes place and leads to an electric field, which causes uh, the overlap in the electron hole wave function in space uh, to be less aligned in the case of the polar plane or the C plane on the top. So by reducing the electron field at the sidewalls, we've increased the overlap of the electron hole wave function and led to a more efficient recombination of electrons and holes on that surface. So before we get into looking at the properties of a micro LED array, uh, we should analyze a single pillar in order to determine what are the effects of the array and what are, are native to just the pillar. Uh, so first we can look at, uh, through CL, compositional and variation and defects in the sample. So here we have an SEM image of the, the top of, uh, from the top down of a hexagonal core shell pillar. Um, we can take a spectrum image of that sample and say, uh, this is a, a spectrum image that's been stacked up so that it's relatively panchromatic. There's no uh, selectivity of information on the light here. This is all of the light stacked up. And so we can see the relative intensity is such that, as we would kind of expect, most of the emission from that sample is coming from the outer walls of the pillar. Um, since it's a spectrum image, we can collect spectrum from points one, two, and three here, uh, but any point on the sample would do. So looking at the spectrum, we can see that there's quite a, an amount of variation uh, across the surface and in the spectrum. So then we can make bands and take a look at what is, uh, what is the intensity across the surface from each of the three characteristic bands. Uh, the one at 365 is the native gallium nitride band gap. Uh, the, at 430, we can see the indium gallium nitride band gap. And then what is that, 560, we can see uh, kind of the point defect band. So this is kind of just uh, giving you an idea of where the emission is coming from across the surface of the sample. You can take the information about the indium gallium nitride peak and through a nonlinear least square fitting routine, you can fit it to a Gaussian and determine where is the central, central wavelength of that emission. We can take that back to a reference source, as you can see here, and map the band gap back to the indium content. And with this resource, we can estimate what is the indium content across the surface of the, the core shell pillar. Uh, this allows us to do compositional mapping uh, through CL. As you can see here, uh, towards the outside, we have a higher indium concentration, which is, again, sort of what we would expect in our core shell um, pillar. But it doesn't answer the question, which direction is the light going? To answer that question, we use a technique called angle resolved cathode luminescence, where since the sample has been positioned at the optical focus of the parabolic collection mirror, the light that comes out has been collimated into the detector such that every position on the parabolic mirror is unique. So every position projected onto the detector corresponds to a slice of the solid angle. Uh, emitted from the surface of the sample. So we can make a map of that sample through the image on the mirror and relate that back to the angles as they were emitted from the sample. So looking at uh, a single core shell pillar, we use the electron beam again to excite the light. And since we know the surface angle is going to affect the outcoupling, because that's a common, uh, kind of a common thing in LEDs since there's an index change at the surface. So as you go from the material to, to outside of the material, you have a, a stark index change, and that contrast leads to a critical angle and internal reflection effect. Um, so here I have a ray that's been depicted as coming from the generation volume and leaving the surface uh, kind of opposite to the uh, surface where the electron beam has excited it. Um, so we can look at where the light is coming at out using angle resolved CL. So here we have an angle resolved CL pattern uh, that's coming from an excitation here on the sample surface. And what we can see is some sort of an interference pattern. So just to be sure we all know what we're looking at, uh, this is a polar plot that describes the emission direction, uh, theta and phi as emitted from the sample. Uh, so these axes should help kind of explain 
what angles we're looking at and how they're depicted in the polar plot. And we can see here uh, the polar angle and the azimuthal angle. And so removing those axes for clarity as we scan the electron beam around the edge of the sample, we can see the corresponding angle resolved CL pattern. And what you can see is that, in general, the angle-resolved CL pattern is, is emitted with high intensity opposite the, the point of excitation. And there's also this interference effect that's taking place. So what's likely happening is that there's reflection from the surface, uh, as depicted um, by the blue ray. We're getting the largest amount of emission coming opposite the side of excitation. And then also probably uh, a ray that's coming out through the bottom or through the side of, of the pillar, reflecting off of the substrate and then interfering with that other ray. So there's a diagram depicted on the right. <clears throat> so moving on to the hexagonal pillar array, we can kind of answer the question, what effects will the array have on the emission characteristics of uh, these hex pillars? So here we have uh, just some images of what that hex pillar sample looks like whenever the, the pillars are in the array. Again, we can look at the compositional and variational defects uh, through CL. Uh, in this case, they're a little bit more effective than, than exact um, because we're looking at the combined effects of a single pillar in the array. And so with a cathode luminescence spectrum image, we again extract spectra from points one, two, and three and highlighting bands, uh, including the gallium nitride band, uh, the indium gallium nitride band, and then point defects around 560 in the defect band, uh, we can see a little bit of a, a different sort of effect here. If you recall, the gallium nitride peak, it was most intense around the center of the blue. So here, it was the most intense. Uh, here, you have sort of the opposite effect, where it's intense towards the outside as opposed to the peak. Uh, you can see the indium gallium nitride is, is a little bit brighter towards the center, um, indicating some sort of enhancement that's coming from the array. And uh, likewise, the point defects is modified in a way that it's bright towards the center as opposed to the outside. Um, what you can also see is that the spectrum coming from point three, uh, up in the, the top right of the screen, uh, you can see uh, several peaks in the defect band that were not there before. And so that's another enhancement effect that's coming from the array. By overlaying uh, those three color bands, what we can see is kind of where is that relative intensity coming? And so you can tell that towards the center of the pillars in the array, uh, you're getting a large influence from the defect band. So uh, coming with an excitation uh, around the center, you're getting most most excitation from the point defects and towards the outside you're getting mostly uh, the quantum well effect. Again we can use nonlinear least square fitting to map uh, CL data to show us where is the uh, or what is the indium concentration across the surface of these samples and kind of contrary to what we saw before um, you can kind of see the the indium concentration tends to decay as we move towards the outside of the pillar. And that's not something that's that's uh, kind of obvious at this point. So then it makes sense to kind of compare these sorts of effects and determine what, what effect is the array having on the emission characteristic. So looking at the CL spectrum image that's been stacked up, so this is sort of, again, a panchromatic image, um, we can see right away the difference is that the entire pillar for the array has been activated whenever it's been excited at the center, indicating some sort of uh, collective effect from the array. Whereas for the single pillar, it's relatively dark at the inside. And so once again, we can extract spectra from characteristic points throughout the sample. Look at the, the colorized bands that have been acquired and determine kind of the differences and it helps to put them kind of side by side so you can see what the differences are between the array and the single pillar by itself. And again, with the nonlinear least squares fitting method, you can see kind of the effective concentration of the indium across the hex pillar surface. And it's been adjusted 
uh, based on the effects of the array. So looking at the ensemble, uh, as opposed to uh, a single pillar, we can find what is the emission pattern through angle resolved CL. So we can tell in the, in the array format, uh, what angle is the light coming off? And so again, the polar plot is describing emission intensity in a given direction, and it's telling us kind of where the light is coming out, but not at what wavelengths. Uh, what we can see in that pattern is that we have highly anisotropic emission, which means we have kind of directions that are selective for emission. We have a strong emission towards the outside, which is kind of matching uh, the surface of the pillars and the, the angle that they have with the surface. Uh, and then there's a weak emission kind of coming straight out towards a viewer. Uh, so these emission directions are directly related to the shape of the of the hex pillars and their orientation in the array. Um, but again, it doesn't answer the question of which direction are the colors going. So is this uh, wavelength specific or are, are, all, are all colors going out at the same direction? To answer this, we employ a technique called wavelength resolve and angle resolve CL. Uh, so for the single pillar, uh, we've collected a wavelength and angle resolve CL pattern. Uh, I'm going to play a short video now that, that as we scan through wavelengths, you'll see, again, one of those polar plots as it scans through um, the visible wavelengths and into the infrared. And what you'll notice is that, in general, the single pillar doesn't have any sort of predictable behavior. It just sort of has this, this, ran, this bit of randomness to it, um, especially towards the, the greens and the blues. However, in the array, I'm going to play the same video for you. Uh, as we scan through the wavelengths, you can see uh, a symmetric variation in the emission direction as a function of wavelength. And so those effects are coming from the pillars in the array as opposed to a single pillar by itself. And so the videos can be a little jarring to see uh, and they kind of they go away rather quickly and so here are some, some single wavelength extractions with about two nanometers of bandwidth where you can see kind of what are the emission directions uh, at those wavelengths. So these are AR patterns at a given wavelength. Um, <clears throat> what you'll notice is that the single pillar is missing a slice of angle space uh, towards the left side. Uh, that's coming from the shape of the collection mirror, whereas for the array, uh, that angle space has been covered up because due to the symmetry, uh, we were able to rotate the sample and fill in that angle space. So there's a few acquisitions that took place uh, for the array case, and they were averaged together to give you this more full circular pattern. Um, what we can say, though, is that the micro LED pillar emits different colors at different angles, uh, depending on whether it's in or not in the array. Uh, the angular emission selectivity from the array ensemble is greatly enhanced by the array, both in intensity uh, and in directionality, due to uh, either reflections, interference, or photonic effects, or some combination of those things. So to summarize, uh, cathode luminescence reveals uh, local emission properties with nanometer scale resolution. Uh, it enables the correlation of optical properties with material composition. Um, we can we can uh, see the enhancement in a micro LED that's been uh, formatted into an array as compared to a single micro LED pillar. And uh, the light emission direction for an LED depends on its shape, its color, and whether or not it's in an array lattice. Um, the wavelength and angular resolved CL is critical for analyzing the emission selectivity in anisotropy and anisotropy in those, uh, those sorts of situations. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. So um, 
Again, if you have questions, please enter them into the questions pane. And uh, since we have a little bit of time left, we'll address some of those questions now. Okay, I think we have time for about three questions. Um, the first one, so what is the time to acquire the wavelength and angle resolved data? So the wavelength and angle resolved data, um, the intensity of it is always going to depend on what sort of sample we're looking at. Uh, it's going to depend on the beam properties like voltage and, and beam current. Um, but depending on the sample, uh, you can reduce the time down to about 30 to 45 seconds uh, in, in kind of the, the faster case. Um, what about in a longer case? So for, uh, for your weaker emitting samples, um, you could see something like 5 to 10 minutes. Or a, a full wavelength angular acquisition. Okay, it looks like our next question is um, you discussed the micro LED array, um, but can you sort, can this sort of analysis be applied to plasmonic samples? Absolutely. In fact, um, as long as the electron beam can excite uh, the plasmonic mode in a plasmonic sample, um, we can do that sort of analysis. And in fact, we can. We can usually generate and find plasmonic band gaps depending on, on what sort of samples we're looking at. Okay, and then our third one for today is going to be, um, does the autofocus work with all surfaces, or is there a surface the autofocus will not work with? Good question. Um, so the, the autofocus routine is, is, first of all, it's independent of the CL emission of the sample. So even if the sample doesn't emit light very strongly, uh, you can still use the autofocus routine to get the sample to the appropriate height. Um, <clears throat> and some samples uh, have a, a bit of roughness, and, and in fact, some of them are, are cracked, depending on, on what they're used for. Um, but if the sample has around 1% reflectivity at the, at the source wavelength, um, Yes, it'll work as long as you have a moderate amount of reflectivity around 1%. Thank you. Um, it looks like a lot of the other questions are very detailed and you're going to have to address those offline. Um, so just as a reminder, please put in any questions that you have and we will address them offline. Um, and it's been a pleasure listening to you today, Jonathan. And thank you everyone for registering. Real quick, the next webinar is going to be July 17th. Um, the title of it is Cathaluminescence Explained, Episode 3, The Analysis Modes for Geoscience Applications. Um, please be on the lookout for invita invitations going out um, into your email box as well as um, our events page on gatan.com. Again, thank you.